on the nature of things by titus lucretius carus translated by william ellery leonard book one part one proem mother of rome delight of gods and men dear venus that beneath the gliding stars makest to teem the many voyaged main and fruitful lands for all of living things through thee alone are evermore conceived through thee are risen to visit the great sun before thee goddess and thy coming on flee stormy wind and massy cloud away for thee the deedal earth bears scented flowers for thee waters of the unvexed deep smile and the hollows of the serene sky glow with diffused radiance for thee for soon as comes the springtime face of day and procreant gales blow from the west unbarred first fowls of air smit to the heart by thee for token thy approach o thou divine and leap the wild herds round the happy fields or swim the bounding torrents thus amain seized with the spell all creatures follow thee whithersoever thou walkest forth to lead and thence through seas and mountains and swift streams through leafy homes of birds and greening plains kindling the lure of love in every breast thou bringest the eternal generations forth kind after kind and since tis thou alone guidest the cosmos and without thee naught is risen to reach the shining shores of light nor aught of joyful or of lovely born thee do i crave co-partner in that verse which i presume on nature to compose for memmius mine whom thou hast willed to be peerless in every grace at every hour wherefore indeed divine one give my words immortal charm lull to a timely rest o'er sea and land the savage works of war for thou alone hast power with public peace to aid mortality since he who rules the savage works of battle puissant mars how often to thy bosom flings his strength or mastered by the eternal wound of love and there with eyes and full throat backward thrown gazing my goddess open-mouthed at thee pastures on love his greedy sight his breath hanging upon thy lips him thus reclined fill with thy holy body round above pour from those lips soft syllables to win peace for the romans glorious lady peace for in a season troublous to the state neither may i attend this task of mine with thought untroubled nor mid such events the illustrious scion of the memmian house neglect the civic cause whilst humankind throughout the lands lay miserably crushed before all eyes beneath religion who would show her head along the region skies glowering on mortals with her hideous face a greek it was who first opposing dared raise mortal eyes that terror to withstand whom nor the fame of gods nor lightning stroke nor threatening thunder of the ominous sky abashed but rather chafed to angry zest his dauntless heart to be the first to rend the cross-bars at the gates of nature old and thus his will and hardy wisdom won and forward thus he fared afar beyond the flaming ramparts of the world until he wandered the unmeasurable all whence he to us a conqueror reports what things can rise to being what cannot and by what law to each its scope prescribed its boundary stone that clings so deep in time wherefore religion now is under foot and us his victory now exalts to heaven i know how hard it is in latian verse to tell the dark discoveries of the greeks chiefly because our pauper speech must find strange terms to fit the strangeness of the thing 
yet worth of thine and the expected joy of thy sweet friendship do persuade me on to bear all toil and wake the clear nights through seeking with what of words and what of song i may at last most gloriously uncloud for thee the light beyond wherewith to view the core of being at the centre hid and for the rest summon to judgments true unbusied ears and singleness of mind withdrawn from cares lest these my gifts arranged for thee with eager service thou disdain before thou comprehendest since for thee i prove the supreme law of gods and sky and the primordial germs of things unfold whence nature all creates and multiplies and fosters all and whither she resolves each in the end when each is overthrown this ultimate stock we have devised to name procreant atoms matter seeds of things or primal bodies as primal to the world i fear perhaps thou deemest that we fare an impious road to realms of thought profane but tis that same religion often or far hath bred the foul impieties of men as once at aulus the elected chiefs foremost of heroes danaean counsellors defiled diana's altar virgin queen with agamemnon's daughter foully slain she felt the chaplet round her maiden locks and fillets fluttering down on either cheek and at the altar marked her grieving sire the priest beside him who concealed the knife and all the folk in tears at sight of her with a dumb terror and a sinking knee she dropped nor might avail her now that first was she who gave the king a father's name they raised her up they bore the trembling girl on to the altar hither led not now with solemn rites and hymeneal choir but sinless woman sinfully fordone a parent felled her on her bridal day making his child a sacrificial beast to give the ships auspicious winds for troy such are the crimes to which religion leads and there shall come the time when even thou forced by the soothsayer's terror tales shalt seek to break from us ah many a dream even now can they concoct to rout thy plans of life and trouble all thy fortunes with base fears i own with reason for if men but knew some fixed end to ills they would be strong by some device unconquered to withstand religions and the menacings of seers but now nor skill nor instrument is theirs since men must dread eternal pains in death for what the soul may be they do not know whether tis born or enter in at birth and whether snatched by death it die with us or visit the shadows and the vasty caves of orcus or by some divine decree enter the brute herds as our ennius sang who first from lovely helicon brought down a laurel wreath of bright perennial leaves renowned for ever among the italian clans yet ennius too in everlasting verse proclaims those vaults of acheron to be though thence he said nor souls nor bodies fair but only phantom figures strangely wan and tells how once from out those regions rose old homer's ghost to him and shed salt tears and with his words unfolded nature's source then be it ours with steady mind to clasp the purport of the skies the law behind the wandering courses of the sun and moon to scan the powers that speed all life below but most to see with reasonable eyes of what the mind of what the soul is made and what it is so terrible that breaks on us asleep or waking in disease until we seem to mark and hear at hand dead men whose bones earth bosomed long ago end of book one part one 
Recording by Daniel Vermont, Osaka, Japan. Book One, Part Two of On the Nature of Things by Titus Lucretius Carus. Translated by William Ellery Leonard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Daniel Vermont. Book One, Part Two Substance is Eternal. This terror, then, this darkness of the mind, not sunrise with its flaring spokes of light, nor glittering arrows of morning can disperse, but only nature's aspect and her law, which, teaching us, hath this exordium. Nothing from nothing ever yet was born. Fear holds dominion over mortality only because seeing in land and sky so much the cause whereof no wise they know men think divinities are working there meantime when once we know from nothing still nothing can be create we shall divine more clearly what we seek those elements from which alone all things created are and how accomplished by no tool of gods. Suppose all sprang from all things. Any kind might take its origin from any thing, no fixed seed required. Men from the sea might rise, and from the land the scaly breed, and fowl full-fledged come bursting from the sky. The horned cattle, the herds, and all the wild would haunt with varying offspring tilth and waste nor would the same fruits keep their olden trees, but each might grow from any stock or limb, by chance and change. Indeed, and were there not for each its procreant atoms, could things have each its unalterable mother old? But, since produced from fixed seeds are all, each birth goes forth upon the shores of light from its own stuff, from its own primal bodies and all from all cannot become, because in each resides a secret power its own. Again, why see we lavished o'er the lands at spring the rose, at summer heat the corn, the vines that mellow when the autumn lures, if not because the fixed seeds of things at their own season must together stream, and new creations only be revealed when the due times arrive, and pregnant earth safely may give unto the shores of light her tender progenies. But if from naught were their becoming, they would spring abroad suddenly, unforeseen, in alien months, with no primordial germs to be preserved from procreant unions at an adverse hour. Nor, on the mingling of the living seeds, would space be needed for the growth of things, were life an increment of nothing. Then the tiny babe forthwith would walk a man, and from the turf would leap a branching tree. Wonders unheard of, for by nature each slowly increases from its lawful seed, and through that increase shall conserve its kind. Whence take the proof that things enlarge and feed from out their proper matter. Thus it comes that earth, without her seasons of fixed rains, could bear no produce such as makes us glad, and whatsoever lives, if shut from food, prolongs its kind and guards its life no more. Thus easier tis to hold that many things have primal bodies in common, as we see the single letters common to many words, then aught exists without its origins. Moreover, why should nature not prepare men of a bulk to ford the seas afoot, or rend the mighty mountains with their hands, or conquer time with length of days, if not because for all begotten things abides the changeless stuff, and what from that may spring is fixed for evermore? Lastly, 
we see how far the tilled surpass the fields untilled and to the labor of our hands return their more abounding crops there are indeed within the earth primordial germs of things which as the plowshare turns the fruitful clods and kneads the mould we quicken into birth else would ye mark without all toil of ours spontaneous generations fairer forms confess then not from nothing can become since all must have their seeds wherefrom to grow wherefrom to reach the gentle fields of air hence too it comes that nature all dissolves into their primal bodies again and naught perishes ever to annihilation for were aught mortal in its every part before our eyes it might be snatched away unto destruction since no force were needed to sunder its members and undo its bands whereas of truth because all things exist with seed imperishable nature allows destruction nor collapse of aught until some outward force may shatter by a blow or inward craft entering its hollow cells dissolve it down and more than this if time that wastes with eld the works along the world destroy entire consuming matter all whence then may venus back to light of life restore the generations kind by kind or how when thus restored may daedal earth foster and plenish with her ancient food which kind by kind she offers unto each whence may the water springs beneath the sea or inland rivers far and wide away keep the unfathomable ocean full and out of what does ether feed the stars for lapsed years and infinite age must else have eat all shapes of mortal stock away but be it the long ago contained those germs by which this sum of things recruited lives those same infallibly can never die nor nothing to nothing evermore return and too the selfsame power might end alike all things were they not still together held by matter eternal shackled through its parts now more now less a touch might be enough to cause destruction for the slightest force would loose the weft of things wherein no part were of imperishable stock but now because the fastenings of primordial parts are put together diversely and stuff is everlasting things abide the same unhurt and sure until some power comes on strong to destroy the warp and woof of each nothing returns to naught but all return at their collapse to primal forms of stuff lo the rains perish which ether father throws down to the bosom of earth mother but then up springs the shining grain and boughs are green amid the trees and trees themselves wax big and lade themselves with fruits and hence in turn the race of man and all the wild are fed hence joyful cities thrive with boys and girls and leafy woodlands echo with new birds hence cattle fat and drowsy lay their bulk along the joyous pastures whilst the drops of white ooze trickle from distended bags hence the young scamper on their weakling joints along the tender herbs fresh hearts afrisk with warm new milk thus naught of what so seems perishes utterly since nature ever upbuilds one thing from other suffering not to come to birth but through some others death and now since i have taught that things cannot be born from nothing nor the same when born to nothing be recalled doubt not my words because our eyes no primal germs perceive for mark those bodies which though known to be in this our world are yet invisible the winds infuriate lash our face and frame unseen and swamp huge ships and rend the clouds or eddying wildly down bestrew the plains with mighty trees or scour the mountain tops with forest crackling blasts thus 
On they rave with uproar shrill and ominous moan. The winds, tis clear, are sightless bodies sweeping through the sea, the lands, the clouds along the sky, vexing and whirling and seizing all amain. And forth they flow and pile destruction round, even as the water's soft and supple bulk, becoming a river of abounding floods, which a wide downpour from the lofty hills swells with big showers, dashes headlong down fragments of woodland and whole branching trees nor can the solid bridges bide the shock as on the water's whelm the turbulent stream strong with a hundred rains beats round the piers crashes with havoc and rolls beneath its waves down toppled masonry and ponderous stone hurling away whatever would oppose even so must move the blasts of all the winds which when they spread like to a mighty flood hither or thither drive things on before and hurl to ground with still renewed assault or sometimes in their circling vortex seize and bear in cones of whirlwind down the world the winds are sightless bodies and naught else since both in works and ways they rival well the mighty rivers, the visible in form. Then, too, we know the varied smells of things, yet never to our nostrils see them come. With eyes we view not burning heats, nor cold, nor are we wont men's voices to behold, yet these must be corporeal at the base, since thus they smite the senses. Naught there is save body, having property of touch. And raiment, hung by surf chore, grows moist. The same, spread out before the sun, will dry. Yet no one saw how sank the moisture in, nor how by heat off driven. Thus we know that moisture is dispersed about in bits too small for eyes to see. Another case. A ring upon the finger thins away along the underside with years and suns. The drippings from the eaves will scoop the stone. The hooked plowshare, though of iron, wastes amid the fields insidiously. We view the rock-paved highways worn by many feet, and at the gates the brazen statues show their right hands leaner from the frequent touch of wayfarers innumerable who greet. We see how wearing down hath minished these, but just what motes depart at any time, the envious nature of vision bars our sight. Lastly, whatever days and nature add, little by little, constraining things to grow in due proportion. No gaze, however keen, of these our eyes hath watched and known. No more can we observe what's lost at any time, when things wax old with eld and foul decay, or when salt seas eat under beetling crags. Thus nature ever by unseen bodies works. End of Book One, Part Two. Recording by Daniel Vermont, Osaka, Japan. Book One, Part Three of On the Nature of Things by Titus Lucretius Carus. Translated by William Ellery Leonard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Daniel Vermont. Book One, Part Three. The Void. But yet, creation's neither crammed nor blocked about by body. There's in things a void, which to have known will serve thee many a turn, nor will not leave thee wandering in doubt forever searching in the sum of all, and losing faith in these pronouncements mine. There's place intangible, a void and room, for were it not, things could in no wise move, since body's property to block and check would work on all, and at all times the same. 
Thus naught could evermore push forth and go, Since naught elsewhere would yield a starting place. But now, through oceans, lands, and heights of heaven, By divers causes and in divers modes, Before our eyes we mark how much may move, Which, finding not a void, would fail, Deprived of stir and motion, Nay, would then have been nowise begot at all, since matter then had stayed at rest, its parts together crammed. Then, too, however solid objects seem, they yet are formed of matter mixed with void. In rocks and caves the watery moisture seeps, and beady drops stand out like plenteous tears. And food finds way through every frame that lives. The trees increase and yield the season's fruit, because their food throughout the whole is poured, even from the deepest roots, through trunks and boughs. And voices pass the solid walls and fly reverberant through shut doorways of a house, and stiffening frost seeps inward to our bones. Which, but for voids, for bodies to go through, tis clear, could happen in no wise at all. Again, why see we among objects, some of heavier weight, but of no bulkier size? Indeed, if in a ball of wool there be as much of body as in lump of lead, the two should weigh alike, since body tends to load things downward, while the void abides, by contrary nature, the imponderable. Therefore, an object just as large but lighter declares infallibly its more of void, even as the heavier more of matter shows, and how much less of vacant room inside. That which we're seeking with sagacious quest exists infallibly co-mixed with things. The void, the invisible inane. Right here I am compelled a question to expound, For stalling something certain folk suppose, Lest it avail to lead thee off from truth. Waters, they say, before the shining breed Of the swift scaly creatures somehow give, and straightway open sudden liquid paths, because the fishes leave behind them room to which at once the yielding billows stream. Thus things among themselves can yet be moved and change their place, however full the sum. Received opinion, wholly false forsooth. For where can scaly creatures forward dart, save where the waters give them room? Again, where can the billows yield away, so long as ever the fish are powerless to go? Thus, either all bodies of motion are deprived, or things contain admixture of a void, where each thing gets its start in moving on. Lastly, where after impact two broad bodies suddenly spring apart, the air must crowd the whole new void between those bodies formed. But air, however it stream with hastening gusts, can yet not fill the gap at once, for first it makes for one place air diffused through all. And then, if haply any think this comes when bodies spring apart, because the air somehow condenses, wander they from truth. For then a void is formed where none before, and too a void is filled which was before. Nor can air be condensed in such a wise. Nor, granting it could, without a void, I hold it still could not contract upon itself and draw its parts together into one. Wherefore, despite demur and counter-speech, confess thou must, there is a void in things. And still, I might by many an argument here scrape together credence for my words. But for the keen eye these mere footprints serve, whereby thou mayest know the rest thyself. As dogs, full oft with noses on the ground, find out the silent lairs, though hid in brush, of beasts, 
the mountain rangers, when but once they sent the certain footsteps of the way. Thus thou thyself, in themes like these alone, can hunt from thought to thought, and keenly wind along even onward to the secret places and drag out truth. But if thou loiter, loathe, or veer, however little from the point, this I can promise, Memmius, for a fact. Such copious draughts my singing tongue shall pour from the large wellsprings of my plenished breast, that much I dread slow age will steal and coil along our members, and unloose the gates of life within us, ere for thee my verse hath put within thine ears the stores of proofs at hand for one so ever question broached. End of Book One, Part Three Recording by Daniel Vermont, Osaka, Japan Book One, Part Four of On the Nature of Things by Titus Lucretius Carus, translated by William Ellery Leonard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Daniel Vermont. Book One, Part Four. Nothing exists per se except atoms and the void. But now again to weave the tale begun. All nature, then, as self-sustained, consists of twain of things, of bodies, and of void in which they're set, and where they're moved around. For common instinct of our race declares that body, of itself, exists, unless this primal faith, deep-founded, fail us not, naught will there be whereunto to appeal on things occult, when seeking aught to prove by reasonings of mind. Again, without that place and room, which we do call the inane, nowhere could bodies then be set, nor go hither or thither at all, as shown before. Besides, there's naught of which thou canst declare it lives disjoined from body, shut from void, a kind of third in nature. For whatever exists must be a somewhat and the same, if tangible, however light and slight, will yet increase the count of body's sum, with its own augmentation, big or small. But, if intangible, and powerless ever to keep a thing from passing through itself on any side, twill be naught else but that which we do call the empty, the inane. Again, Whate'er exists, as of itself, must either act or suffer action on it, or else be that wherein things move and be. Naught saving body, acts, is acted on. Naught but the inane can furnish room. And thus, beside the inane and bodies, is no third nature amid the number of all things, remainder none to fall at any time under our senses, nor be seized and seen by any man through reasonings of mind. Name or creation with what names thou wilt, thou wilt find but properties of those first twain, or see but accidents those twain produce. A property is that which not at all can be disjoined and severed from a thing without a fatal dissolution. Such weight to the rocks, heat to the fire, and flow to the wide waters, touch to corporal things, intangibility to the viewless void. But state of slavery, pauperhood and wealth, freedom and war and concord, and all else which come and go whilst nature stands the same, we're wont, and rightly, to call accidents. Even time exists not of itself, but sense reads out of things what happened long ago, what presses now, and what shall follow after. No man, we must admit, feels time itself, disjoined from motion and repose of things. Thus, when they say there is the ravishment of Princess Helen, is the siege and sack of Trojan Town, look out! They force us not to admit these acts existent by themselves, merely because those races of mankind, of whom these acts were accidents, long since irrevocable age has borne away. 
for all past actions may be said to be but accidents, in one way of mankind, in other of some region of the world. Add too had been no matter and no room wherein all things go on, the fire of love upblown by that fair form, the glowing coal under the Phrygian Alexander's breast, had ne'er enkindled that renowned strife of savage war, nor had the wooden horse involved in flames old Pergama, by a birth at midnight of a brood of the Hellenes. And thus thou canst remark that every act at bottom exists not of itself, nor is as body is, nor has like name with void, but rather of sort more fitly to be called an accident of body, and of place wherein all things go on. End of Book One, Part Four Recording by Daniel Vermont, Osaka, Japan Book One, Part Five of On the Nature of Things by Titus Lucretius Carus. Translated by William Ellery Leonard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Daniel Vermont. Book One, Part Five Character of the Atoms. Bodies, again, are partly primal germs of things, and partly unions deriving from the primal germs, and those which are the primal germs of things no power can quench, for in the end they conquer by their own solidness. Though hard it be to think that aught in things has solid frame, for lightnings pass no less than voice and shout through hedging walls of houses, and the iron white dazzles in the fire and rocks will burn with exhalations fierce and burst asunder totters the rigid gold dissolved in heat the ice of bronze melts conquered in the flame warmth and the piercing cold through silver seep since with the cups held rightly in the hand we oft feel both as from above is poured the dew of waters between their shining sides so true it is no solid form is found but yet because true reason and nature of things constrain us come whilst in few verses now i disentangle how there still exist bodies of solid everlasting frame the seeds of things the primal germs we teach whence all creation around us came to be first since we know a twofold nature exists of things both twain and utterly unlike body and place in which all things go on then each must be both for and through itself and all unmixed where'er be empty space there body is not and so where body bides there not at all exists the void inane thus primal bodies are solid without a void but since there's void in all begotten things all solid matter must be round the same nor by true reason canst thou prove aught hides and holds a void within its body unless thou grant what holds it be a solid no that which can hold a void of things within can be naught else than matter in union knit thus matter consisting of a solid frame hath power to be eternal though all else though all creation be dissolved away again were naught of empty and inane the world were then a solid as without some certain bodies to fill the places held the world that is were but a vacant void and so infallibly alternate wise body and void are still distinguished since nature knows no wholly full nor void there are then certain bodies possessed of power to vary forever the empty and the full and these can nor be sundered from without by beats and blows nor from within be torn by penetration nor be overthrown by any assault soever through the world for without void naught can be crushed it seems nor broken nor severed by a cut in twain nor can it take the damp or seeping cold or piercing fire those old destroyers three 
but the more void within a thing the more entirely it totters at their sure assault thus if first bodies be as i have taught solid without a void they must be then eternal and if matter ne'er had been eternal long ere now had all things gone back into nothing utterly and all we see around from nothing had been born but since i taught above that naught can be from naught created nor the once begotten to naught be summoned back these primal germs must have an immortality of frame and into these must each thing be resolved when comes its supreme hour that thus there be at hand the stuff for plenishing the world so primal germs have solid singleness nor otherwise could they have been conserved through eons and infinity of time for the replenishment of wasted worlds once more if nature had given a scope for things to be forever broken more and more by now the bodies of matter would have been so far reduced by breakings in old days that from them nothing could at season fixed be born and arrive its prime and top of life for lo each thing is quicker marred than made and so whate'er the long infinitude of days and all four past time would now by this have broken and ruined and dissolved that same could ne'er in all remaining time be builded up for plenishing the world but mark infallibly a fixed bound remaineth stablished gainst their breaking down since we behold each thing so ever renewed and unto all their seasons after their kind wherein they arrive the flower of their age again if bounds have not been set against the breaking down of this corporeal world yet must all bodies of whatever things have still endured from everlasting time unto this present as not yet assailed by shocks of peril but because the same are to thy thinking of a nature frail it ill accords that thus they could remain as thus they do through everlasting time vexed through the ages as indeed they are by the innumerable blows of chance so in our programme of creation mark how tis that though the bodies of all stuff are solid to the core we yet explain the ways whereby some things are fashioned soft air water earth and fiery exhalations and by what force they function and go on the fact is founded in the void of things but if the primal germs themselves be soft reason cannot be brought to bear to show the ways whereby may be created these great crags of basalt and the during iron for their whole nature will profoundly lack the first foundations of a solid frame but powerful in old simplicity abide the solid the primeval germs and by their combinations more condensed all objects can be tightly knit and bound and made to show unconquerable strength again since all things kind by kind obtain fixed bounds of growing and conserving life since nature hath inviolably decreed what each can do what each can never do since naught is changed but all things so abide that ever the variegated birds reveal the spots or stripes peculiar to their kind spring after spring thus surely all that is must be composed of matter immutable for if the primal germs in any wise were open to conquest and to change twould be uncertain also what could come to birth and what could not and by what law to each its scope prescribed its boundary stone that clings so deep in time nor could the generations kind after kind so often reproduce the nature habits motions ways of life of their progenitors and then again since there is ever an extreme bounding point of that first body which our senses now cannot perceive that bounding point indeed exists without all parts a minimum of nature nor was e'er a thing apart as of itself nor shall hereafter be since tis itself still parcel of another a first and single part whence other parts and others similar in order lie in a packed phalanx filling to the full the nature of first body being thus not self-existent they must cleave to that from which in no wise they can sundered be 
so primal germs have solid singleness which tightly packed and closely joined cohere by virtue of their minim particles no compound by mere union of the same but strong in their eternal singleness nature reserving them as seeds for things permitteth naught of rupture or decrease moreover were there not a minimum the smallest bodies would have infinites since then a half of half could still be halved with limitless division less and less then what the difference twixt the sum and least none for however infinite the sum yet even the smallest would consist the same of infinite parts but since true reason here protests denying that the mind can think it convinced thou must confess such things there are as have no parts the minimums of nature and since these are likewise confess thou must that primal bodies are solid and etern again if nature creatress of all things were wont to force all things to be resolved unto least parts then would she not avail to reproduce from out them anything because whate'er is not endowed with parts cannot possess those properties required of generative stuff divers connections weights blows encounters motions whereby things for evermore have being and go on end of book one part five recording by daniel vermont osaka japan book one part six of on the Nature of Things by Titus Lucretius Carus, translated by William Ellery Leonard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Daniel Vermont. Book One, Part Six, Confutation of Other Philosophers. And on such grounds it is that those who held the stuff of things is fire, and out of fire alone the cosmic sum is formed are seen mightily from true reason to have lapsed of whom chief leader to do battle comes that heraclitus famous for dark speech among the silly not the serious greeks who search for truth for dolts are ever prone that to be wonder in a door which hides beneath distorted words holding that true which sweetly tickles in their stupid ears or which is rouged in finely finished phrase for how i ask can things so varied be if formed of fire single and pure no wit would help for fire to be condensed or thinned if all the parts of fire did still preserve but fire's own nature seen before in gross the heat were keener with the parts compressed milder again when severed or dispersed and more than this thou canst conceive of naught that from such causes could become much less might earth's variety of things be born from any fire soever dense or rare this too if they suppose a void in things then fires can be condensed and still left rare but since they see such opposites of thought rising against them and are loath to leave an unmixed void in things they fear the steep and lose the road of truth nor do they see that if from things we take away the void all things are then condensed and out of all one body made which has no power to dart swiftly from out itself not anything as throws the fire its light and warmth around giving thee proof its parts are not compact but if perhaps they think in otherwise fires through their combinations can be quenched and change their substance very well behold if fire shall spare to do so in no part then heat will perish utterly and all and out of nothing would the world be formed for change in anything from out its bounds means instant death of that which was before and thus a somewhat must persist unharmed amid the world lest all return to naught and born from naught abundance thrive anew now since indeed there are those surest bodies which keep their nature evermore the same upon whose going out and coming in and changed order things their nature change and all corporeal substances transformed tis thine to know those primal bodies then are not of fire 
for twere of no avail should some depart and go away and some be added new and some be changed in order if still all kept their nature of old heat for whatsoever they created then would still in any case be only fire the truth i fancy this bodies there are whose clashings motions order posture shapes produce the fire and which by order changed do change the nature of the thing produced and are thereafter nothing like to fire nor whatso else has power to send its bodies with impact touching on the senses touch again to say that all things are but fire and no true thing in number of all things exists but fire as this same fellow says seems crazed folly for the man himself against the senses by the senses fights and hews at that through which is all belief through which indeed unto himself is known the thing he calls the fire for though he thinks the senses truly can perceive the fire he thinks they cannot as regards all else which still are palpably as clear to sense to me a thought inept and crazy too for whither shall we make appeal for what more certain than our senses can there be whereby to mark asunder error and truth besides why rather do away with all and wish to allow heat only than deny the fire and still allow all else to be alike the madness either way it seems thus whosoe'er have held the stuff of things to be but fire and out of fire the sum and whosoever have constituted air as first beginning of begotten things and all whoever have held that of itself water alone contrives things or that earth createth all and changes things anew to divers natures mightily they seem a long way to have wandered from the truth add to whoever make the primal stuff twofold by joining air to fire and earth to water add who deem that things can grow out of the four fire earth and breath and rain as first empedocles of acragas whom that three-cornered isle of all the lands bore on her coasts around which flows and flows in mighty bend and bay the ionic seas splashing the brine from off their grey-green waves here billowing onward through the narrow straits swift ocean cuts her boundaries from the shores of the italic mainland here the waste charybdis and here etna rumbles threats to gather anew such furies of its flames as with its force anew to vomit fires belched from its throat and skyward bear anew its lightnings flash and though for much she seem the mighty and the wondrous isle to men most rich in all good things and fortified with generous strength of heroes she hath ne'er possessed within her aught of more renown nor aught more holy wonderful and dear than this true man nay ever so far and pure the lofty music of his breast divine lifts up its voice and tells of glories found that scarce he seems of human stock create yet he and those forementioned known to be so far beneath him less than he in all though as discoverers of much goodly truth they gave as twere from out of the heart's own shrine responses holier and soundlier based than ever the pythia pronounced for men from out the tripod and the delphian laurel have still in matter of first elements made ruin of themselves and great men great indeed and heavy there for them the fall first because banishing the void from things they yet assign them motion and allow things soft and loosely textured to exist as air dew fire earth animals and grains without admixture of void amid their frame next because thinking there can be no end in cutting bodies down to less and less nor pause established to their breaking up they hold there is no minimum in things albeit we see the boundary point of aught is that which to our senses seems its least whereby thou mayest conjecture that because the things thou canst not mark have boundary points 
they surely have their minimums. Then, too, since these philosophers ascribe to things soft primal germs, which we behold to be of birth and body mortal thus throughout, the sum of things must be returned to naught, and born from naught, abundance thrive anew. Thou seest how far each doctrine stands from truth. And next, these bodies are among themselves in many ways poisons and foes to each, wherefore their congress will destroy them quite, or drive asunder, as we see in storms, rains, winds, and lightnings all asunder fly. Thus, too, if all things are create of four, and all again dissolved into the four, how can the four be called the primal germs of things, more than all things themselves be thought, by retroversion, primal germs of them? For ever alternately are both begot, with interchange of nature and aspect from immemorial time. But if, percase, thou think'st the frame of fire and earth, the air, the dew of water, can in such wise meet as not by mingling to resign their nature, from them for thee no world can be create, no thing of breath, no stock or stalk of tree, in the wild congress of this varied heap each thing its proper nature will display, and air will palpably be seen mixed up with earth together, unquenched heat with water but primal germs in bringing things to birth must have a latent unseen quality lest some outstanding alien element confuse and minish in the thing create its proper being but these men begin from heaven and from its fires and first they feign that fire will turn into the winds of air next that from air the rain begotten is and earth created out of rain and then that all, reversely, are returned from earth, the moisture first, then air, thereafter heat, and that these same ne'er cease in interchange, to go their ways from heaven to earth, from earth unto the stars of the ethereal world, which in no wise at all the germs can do, since an immutable somewhat still must be, lest all things utterly be sped to naught. For changing anything from out its bounds means instant death of that which was before. Wherefore, since those things, mentioned heretofore, suffer a changed state, they must derive from others ever unconvertible, lest all things utterly return to naught. Then why not rather presuppose there be bodies with such a nature furnished forth that, if perchance they have created fire, can still, by virtue of a few withdrawn or added few, and motion and order changed, fashion the winds of air? and thus all things forevermore be interchanged with all. But facts in proof are manifest, thou sayest, that all things grow into the winds of air, and forth from earth are nourished, and unless the season favour at propitious hour with rains enough to set the trees a-reel under the soak of bulking thunderheads, and sun for its share foster and give heat, no grains, nor trees, nor breathing things can grow. True and unless hard food and moisture soft recruited man, his frame would waste away, and life dissolve from out his thews and bones. For out of doubt recruited and fed are we by certain things, as other things by others, because in many ways the many germs common to many things are mixed in things. No wonder tis that, therefore, divers things by divers things are nourished, and again, often it matters vastly with what others, in what positions the primordial germs are bound together, and what motions, too, they give and get among themselves. For these same germs do put together sky, sea, lands, rivers, and sun, grains, trees, and breathing things. But yet commixed they are in divers modes with divers things, forever as they move. Nay, thou beholdest in our verses here elements many, common to many worlds, albeit thou must confess each verse, each word from one another differs both in sense and ring of sound, so much the elements can bring about by change of order alone. But those which are the primal germs of things have power to work more combinations still, whence divers things can be produced in turn. Now let us also take for scrutiny the Homeomeria of Anaxagoras 
so called by Greeks, for which our pauper speech yieldeth no name in the Italian tongue, although the thing itself is not o'er hard for explanation. First, then, when he speaks of this homeomeria of things, he thinks bones to be sprung from littlest bones minute, and from minute and littlest flesh all flesh, and blood created out of drops of blood, conceiving gold compact of grains of gold, and earth concreted out of bits of earth, fire made of fires, and water out of waters, feigning the like with all the rest of stuff. Yet he concedes not any void in things, nor any limit to cutting bodies down. Wherefore to me he seems on both accounts to err no less than those we named before. Add to these germs, he feigns, are far too frail, if they be germs primordial, furnished forth with but same nature as the things themselves, and travail and perish equally with those, and no rain curbs them from annihilation. For which will last against the grip and crush under the teeth of death? The fire? The moist? Or else the air? Which then? The blood? The bones? No one, methinks, when everything will be at bottom as mortal as whate'er we mark to perish by force before our gazing eyes. But my appeal is to the proofs above that things cannot fall back to naught, nor yet from naught increase. And now again, since food augments and nourishes the human frame, tis thine to know our veins and blood and bones and thews are formed of particles unlike to them in kind. Or, if they say, all foods are of mixed substance, having in themselves small bodies of thews and bones, and also veins and particles of blood, then every food, solid or liquid, must itself be thought as made and mixed of things unlike in kind, of bones, of thews, of ichor, and of blood. Again, if all the bodies which upgrow from earth are first within the earth, then earth must be compound of alien substances which spring and bloom abroad from out the earth transfer the argument and thou mayest use the selfsame words if flame and smoke and ash still lurk unseen within the wood the wood must be compound of alien substances which spring from out the wood right here remains a certain slender means to skulk from truth which anaxagoras takes unto himself who holds that all things lurk commixed with all while that one only comes to view, of which the bodies exceed in number all the rest, and lie more close to hand, and at the fore, a notion banished from true reason far. For then twere meet that kernels of the grains should oft, when crunched between the might of stones, give forth a sign of blood, or of aught else which in our human frame is fed, and that rock rubbed on rock should yield a gory ooze, Likewise, the herbs ought oft to give forth drops of sweet milk, flavoured like the uttered sheep's. Indeed, we ought to find, when crumbling up the earthy clods, there herbs and grains and leaves, all sorts dispersed minutely in the soil. Lastly, we ought to find in cloven wood, ashes and smoke, and bits of fire there hid. But since fact teaches this is not the case, tis thine to know things are not mixed with things thus wise but seeds common to many things commixed in many ways must lurk in things but often it happens on skyey hills thou sayest that neighbouring tops of lofty trees are rubbed one against other smote by the blustering south till all ablaze with bursting flower of flame good sooth Yet fire is not in graft in wood, but many are the seeds of heat, and when rubbing together, they together flow, they start the conflagrations in the forests. Whereas if flame, already fashioned, lay stored up within the forests, then the fires could not for any time be kept unseen, but would be laying all the wildwood waste, and burning all the boscage. Now dost see even as we said a little space above, how mightily it matters with what others, in what positions these same primal germs are bound together, and what motions, too, they give and get among themselves, how hence the same, if altered amongst themselves, can body both igneous and ligneous objects forth, precisely as these words themselves are made by somewhat altering their elements, 
although we mark with name indeed distinct the igneous from the ligneous once again if thou suppose whatever thou beholdest among all visible objects cannot be unless thou feign bodies of matter endowed with a like nature by thy vain device for thee will perish all the germs of things twill come to pass they'll laugh aloud like men shaken asunder by a spasm of mirth or moisten with salty teardrops cheeks and chins End of Book One, Part Six. Recording by Daniel Vermont, Osaka, Japan. Book One, Part Seven of On the Nature of Things by Titus Lucretius Carus. Translated by William Ellery Leonard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Daniel Vermont. Book One, Part Seven the infinity of the universe now learn of what remains more keenly here and for myself my mind has not deceived how dark it is but the large hope of praise hath struck with pointed thyrsus through my heart on the same hour hath struck into my breast sweet love of the muses wherewith now instinct i wander afield thriving in sturdy thought through unpathed taunts of the pyrides trodden by step of none before i joy to come on undefiled fountains there to drain them deep i joy to pluck new flowers to seek for this my head a signal crown from regions where the muses never yet have garlanded the temples of a man first since i teach concerning mighty things and go right on to loose from round the mind the tightened coils of dread religion next since concerning themes so dark i frame songs so pellucid touching all throughout even with the muse's charm which as twould seem is not without a reasonable ground but as physicians when they seek to give young boys the nauseous wormwood first do touch the brim around the cup with the sweet juice and yellow of the honey in order that the thoughtless age of boyhood be cajoled as far as the lips and meanwhile swallow down the wormwood's bitter draught and though befooled be yet not, not merely duped but rather thus grow strong again with recreated health so now i too since this my doctrine seems in general somewhat woeful unto those who've had it not in hand and since the crowd starts back from it in horror have desired to expound our doctrine unto thee in song soft speaking and pyrian and as twere to touch it with sweet honey of the muse if by such method haply i might hold the mind of thee upon these lines of ours till thou see through the nature of all things and how exists the interwoven frame but since i've taught that bodies of matter made completely solid hither and thither fly forevermore unconquered through all time now come and whether to the sum of them there be a limit or be none for thee let us unfold likewise what has been found to be the wide inane or room or space wherein all things soever do go on let us examine if it finite be all and entire or reach unmeasured round and downward an illimitable profound thus then the all that is is limited in no one region of its onward paths for then it must have forever its beyond and a beyond tis seen can never be for aught unless still further on there be a somewhat somewhere that may bound the same so that the thing be seen still on to where the nature of sensation of that thing can follow it no longer now because confess we must there's naught beside the sum there's no beyond and so it lacks all end it matters nothing where thou post thyself in whatsoever regions of the same even any place a man has set him down still leaves about him the unbounded all outward in all directions or 
supposing a moment the all of space finite to be, if some one farthest traveller runs forth unto the extreme coasts, and throws ahead a flying spear, is it then thy wish to think it goes, hurled off a main, to where twas sent, and shoots afar? Or that some object there can thwart and stop it? For the one or other thou must admit and take either of which shuts off escape for thee, and does compel that thou concede the all spreads everywhere, owning no confines, since whether there be aught that may block and check it, so it comes not where twas sent, nor lodges in its goal, or whether borne along, in either view it has started not from any end. And so I'll follow on, and wheresoe'er thou set the extreme coasts, I'll query, what becomes thereafter of thy spear? T'will come to pass that nowhere can a world's end be, and that the chance for further flight prolongs forever the flight itself. Besides, were all the space of the totality and sum shut in with fixed coasts and bounded everywhere, then would the abundance of world's matter flow together by solid weight from everywhere still downward to the bottom of the world nor aught could happen under cope of sky, nor could there be a sky at all, or sun. Indeed, where matter all one heap would lie, by having settled during infinite time. But in reality, repose is given unto no bodies amongst the elements, because there is no bottom whereunto they might, as twere, together flow, and where they might take up their undisturbed abodes. In endless motion, Everything goes on forevermore, out of all regions, even out of the pit below, from forth the vast are hurtled bodies evermore supplied. The nature of room, the space of the abyss, is such that even the flashing thunderbolts can neither speed upon their courses through, gliding across eternal tracts of time, nor further bring to pass, as on they run, that they may bait their journeying one whit. Such huge abundance spreads for things around, room off to every quarter without end. Lastly, before our very eyes is seen thing to bound thing. Air hedges hill from hill, and mountain walls hedge air. Land ends the sea, and sea in turn all lands. But for the all truly is nothing which outside may bound. That, too, the sum of things itself may not have power to fix a measure of its own. Great nature guards, she who compels the void to bound all body, as body all the void, thus rendering by these alternates the whole an infinite. Or else the one or other, being unbounded by the other, spreads, even by its single nature, nevertheless immeasurably forth nor sea, nor earth, nor shining vaults of sky, nor breed of mortals, nor holy limbs of gods, could keep their place least portion of an hour. For, driven apart from out its meetings fit, the stock of stuff, dissolved, would be borne along the illimitable inane afar, or rather, in fact, would ne'er have once combined and given a birth to aught, since, scattered wide, it could not be united. For of truth, neither by counsel did the primal germs establish themselves, as by keen act of mind, each in its proper place, nor did they make, forsooth, a compact how each germ should move. But since, being many and changed in many modes along the all, they're driven abroad and vexed by blow on blow, even from all time of old, they thus at last, after attempting all the kinds of motion and conjoining, come into those great arrangements out of which this sum of things established is create, by which, moreover, through the mighty years, it is preserved, when once it has been thrown into the proper motions, bringing to pass that ever the streams refresh the greedy main with river waves abounding and that earth lapped in warm exhalations of the sun renews her broods and that the lusty race of breathing creatures bears and blooms and that the gliding fires of ether are alive what still the primal germs no wise could do unless from out the infinite of space could come supply of matter whence in season there want whatever losses to repair 
for as the nature of breathing creatures wastes losing its body when deprived of food so all things have to be dissolved as soon as matter diverted by what means soever from off its course shall fail to be on hand nor can the blows from outward still conserve on every side whatever sum of a world has been united in a whole they can indeed by frequent beating check a part till others arriving may fulfil the sum but meanwhile often are they forced to spring rebounding back and as they spring to yield unto those elements whence a world derives room and a time for flight permitting them to be from off the massy union born free and afar wherefore again again needs must there come a many for supply and also that the blows themselves shall be unfailing ever must there ever be an infinite force of matter all sides round and in these problems shrink my memmius far from yielding faith to that notorious talk that all things inward to the centre press and thus the nature of the world stands firm with never blows from outward nor can be nowhere disparted since all height and depth have always inward to the centre pressed if thou art ready to believe that aught itself can rest upon itself or that the ponderous bodies which be under earth do all press upwards and do come to rest upon the earth in some way upside down like to those images of things we see at present through the waters they contend with like procedure that all breathing things head downward roam about and yet cannot tumble from earth to realms of sky below no more than these our bodies wing away spontaneously to vaults of sky above that when those creatures look upon the sun we view the constellations of the night and that with us the seasons of the sky they thus alternately divide and thus do pass the night co-equal to our days but a vain error has given these dreams to fools which they've embraced with reasoning perverse for centre none can be where world is still boundless nor yet if now a centre were could aught take there a fixed position more than for some other cause t might be dislodged for all of room and space we call the void must both through centre and non-centre yield alike to weights where'er their motions tend nor is there any place where when they've come bodies can be at standstill in the void deprived of force of weight nor yet may void furnish support to any nay it must true to its bent of nature still give way thus in such manner not at all can things be held in union as if overcome by craving for a centre but besides seeing they feign that not all bodies press to centre inward rather only those of earth and water liquid of the sea and the big billows from the mountain slopes and whatsoever are encased as twere in earthen body contrariwise they teach how the thin air and with it the hot fire is borne asunder from the centre and how for this all ether quivers with bright stars and the sun's flame along the blue is fed because the heat from out the centre flying all gathers there and how again the boughs upon the tree-tops could not sprout their leaves unless little by little from out the earth for each were nutriment lest after the manner of the winged flames the ramparts of the world should flee away dissolved amain throughout the mighty void and lest all else should likewise follow after ay lest the thundering vaults of heaven should burst and splinter upward and the earth forthwith withdraw from under our feet and all its bulk among its mingled wrecks and those of heaven with slipping asunder of the primal seeds should pass along the immeasurable inane away for ever and that instant not a rack and remnant would be left beside the desolate space and germs invisible for on whatever side thou deemest first the primal bodies lacking lo that side will be for things the very door of death where through the throng of matter all will dash out and abroad these points if thou wilt ponder then with but paltry trouble led along 
for one thing after other will grow clear nor shall the blind night rob thee of the road to hinder thy gaze on nature's farthest forth thus things for things shall kindle torches new end of book 1 part 7 recording by daniel vamont osaka japan